Oh boy, I'm a little giddy for this one. He is a two-time Bassmaster Angler of the Year, the first ever Bassmaster millionaire. He fished 25 Bassmaster Classics, won 14 Bassmaster events, including the 1983 Bassmaster Classic. He's a 15-time FLW Cup qualifier, four wins over at FLW, and he's fishing the Elite Series this year. The General Larry Nixon joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And um, I'm giddy this week, I'll be honest. Um, and not just because it's our final show in November and uh, tomorrow is December, hard to believe. Um, I'm giddy because we have freaking Larry Nixon on the show this week. And um, I mean, I don't think you have to watch too many episodes to realize how much a fan and how appreciative I am of the history of this sport. And Larry Nixon is a huge part of that history. I mean, if you had to build a Mount Rushmore for influential people in the tournament world, I mean, obviously Ray Scott's on it, but there is so many names kind of batted around. Well, not so many. There's literally a handful of names. You know, I'm not going to even start to name names. Um, but Larry Nixon's name is part of that group that gets thrown around. And and speaking of which, before we get into this, let's have a little fun in the comments. Let me know who is on your Mount Rushmore of tournament fishing. There's no right or no wrong in this answer. The only wrong is if you don't include Ray Scott, then you're wrong because, I mean, he is the chicken that laid the egg. Um, but let me know. Put a list down. No right or wrong would be a fun debate. Let me know in the comments. But Larry Nixon is one of the names that is always throwing out in that group and uh, what he has accomplished what he means this sport is amazing one of the most iconic fish catches maybe the most iconic fish catch that was larry nixon at the beginning of the Bassmaster shows all those ones you turned in the dudes leaned on oh gosh look at the size of that bass it's exact words he said at that moment and those exact words are kind of burned into my soul you know what I mean? It's like the music. It's like the old Bassmaster music. You hear that, and it it doesn't just, it's not just a memory. It takes you to a place. It takes you from wherever you are. And and to see that fish catch of Larry Nixon, I mean, it, it takes me back to Sunday nights on TNN. You know what I mean? The, the watching those shows, um, the reason I had a VCR up till not too long ago, literally just to be able to watch old Bassmaster shows. And um, in so many amazing memories, so many amazing things. And Larry Nixon is a big part of it. And what Larry Nixon is doing this year is incredible. It's something I never thought, you know, like if I, if I had to write down, I mean, it's weird. What I do for a living, announcing anglers, you would think, um, I try not to overthink it, but but like when people say, well, what are some of the cool things that have happened? Like I always include like Denny Brower. I'm so thankful that I got to announce one of Denny Brower's victories, his last victory in the Elite Series before he retired. And that's not, I mean, it's not a boastful thing. It's just like, I mean, you, you want to be able to, see some of this and 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 be a small part of it and one of the regrets that i thought i always had is man i wish i had been with bass when larry nixon was here and guess who's back back again larry nixon returning to the Bassmaster elite series in 2023 as part of the legends exemption and if larry nixon isn't the legend i don't know who is I really just do not know who is, um, but Larry Nixon, 
is an incredible angler, incredible accomplishments, and I'm excited to watch this year go down. And uh, the good news is, due to the magic of video conferencing, we don't have to wait until the Elite Series kicks off. Let's travel all the way to Bee Branch, Arkansas, and join up with the general himself, Larry Nixon. Wow. Larry Nixon, there, there is, uh, I'll be honest, there's a lot of me that doesn't even understand that this is happening right now. I'm interviewing or having a chat with Larry Nixon, but we're going to be having a lot of chats this year, Larry. I'm planning on it, Dave, and looking forward to it. You can bet on it. I just hope I can catch enough fish to make you happy. Well, it, it, I'll be happy. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. I, I'll be happy, and, and I have faith in you. But um, well, the feedback industry-wide, obviously, for those of you that don't know, Larry Nixon is fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series in 2023. The feedback that I've seen has been unbelievably positive uh on your end i assume the same yes it's been uh way more than i thought it would be to be honest with you everybody is so excited that i'm back with bass that it's it's been incredible and uh i'm not real good at posting stuff and i did make an official post and then i shared everything you know but it's been it's been kind of unreal yeah i guess that's a, a I mean, your entire career, before we even get into that, your entire career, but I mean, like, the whole posting and everything, I mean, obviously that isn't brand, brand new, but, I mean, it's a lot more, it seems like, you, I mean, even the uh, setting this up, I mean, you're set for all of them now, I would imagine, but, but I mean, is this is stuff that you don't do a lot of, is it, Larry? No, it's, you know, it's, this is stuff that you have to learn and to be honest with you, I've always been focused on one or two things, and that's hunting and fishing. <laughs> and the, all this video stuff and uh, uh, Zoom meetings, and uh, it, it's Greek to me. And I had to go get this little tripod to set my phone on so we could talk and I had to keep my son to figure out how to get on microphone so he <laughs> could hear me hear you. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a learning curve. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, I mean, but you never know what'll happen with the video because I, I know a dude who once caught a big bass and said, Oh my gosh, look at the size of that bass. Do you have any idea how many times in my life I have literally said that? And, oh, and thousands of maybe millions of anglers have said that. Did you have any idea at that moment when you were catching that fish that, hey, this is going to become one of the most iconic lines in the history of bass fishing? I never dreamed at that moment it was. And, uh, you know, when I caught that fish, I guess I was talking to my cameraman. I knew he was back there. I didn't even think about it going worldwide and uh, being on YouTube and everywhere else now. And, uh, you know, it was just, uh, it just happened to be one of the greatest moments in bass fishing. And everybody will tell you, oh my gosh, did you see the size of that bass? I hear <laughs> Everywhere I go. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever stop and think, man, if I would not known it was going to get shared that much, I, sh I would have said something different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't have changed the thing because that was me. Yeah. That, tro that trophy is right there on that wall behind me. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but uh, yeah, it's right there. And I think that is the key. Like, I think it's lost a lot, but I think what makes that line so special and so iconic, I mean, there's people that can think up all these different things, but that's just real. You can tell, like, there, everybody has had that feeling that whether, you know, maybe yours is a little intensified because it was in a big tournament, but, I mean, that that's how an angler feels when they hook up. There is no doubt about it. That was uh, the one of the greatest moments of my career, you know, that and went in the classic with Ray Scott and his arm around me and, and all of that, you know, it, uh, but that fish jumping out of the water, you know, he didn't jump straight up and shake his head like most large mouth. He jumped out of the water and looked right straight at my boat and sat parallel to the water. And it was like, Oh, I ain't never seen a fish that big in my whole life, but he, <laughs> He only weighed seven seven so uh but the way he looked at that very moment it was incredible 
It really was. It, it, it's one of the most iconic shots in, in fishing. But you you brought him up, Ray Scott. The world lost Ray Scott this year. But, what, I mean, and I've talked to a lot of different pros, and they've given kind of their thoughts on Ray Scott. But to be honest, a lot of people that you're talking to nowadays, they don't have the experience you have. What? Well, tell me about Ray Scott and, and what he meant to you. Well, Ray was the greatest publicity stunt in the world. And, you know, he knew how to do it right. Everything he did was right. From taking care of the ladies at the Classic and uh, giving them something to do while they're out competing or while we're out competing. And uh, uh, he, he was the best promoter that this sport will ever see. That's, you know, I, I don't know any other way to put it. And uh, he was a leader, a fisherman, and, you know, he, he just, he would get it done. There was no such thing as no. If there was going to be something right in tournament fishing and the Bassmasters Classic, it was going to be done right. And Ray was a great leader. And, uh, oh, my gosh, we all miss him. You know, you know I do. Yeah. What, I mean, I, people will st- throw it around for years and years forever. I mean, people will say without Ray Scott would have it ever been. And I think that there would have been tournament fishing somewhere. You know what I mean? There was tournaments happening, but it would have never been what it is today. It, 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 I mean, if you don't believe that, just look at other sports that, that people projected to, I mean, we fill an arena every year and I get it. People harp on the fact that we're not charging for tickets, but Go see how hard it is to fill an arena, but regardless, you know what I mean? It, but it's, it's the seed that he planted and it, it all, it grew in all of us really. Yes. He, he was the leader of fishermen and, you know, there's no other fishing industry that's got as many lifetime members as Bass does. And I've been a lifetime member since I first started tournament fishing and, uh, you know, when I go to the classic, I see that Wednesday, I think it is when they show them the opening part of the show. Yeah. All of them lifetime members for so long to them, you know, that's a homecoming and they all come in. It's, it's unbelievable. Really. It really is unbelievable. I, I want to witness it again. Fishing side. Well, what made you fall in love with like, when I think of Bass and I think of the connections that I have, I mean, I was a kid sitting on the carpet in front of a TV, looking up and that's when I fell in love with bass and, and bass fishing. And, and you were part of the reason, but for you, it must've been a much more organic entrance. I mean, you started in 77. It was, you were just chasing the biggest tournament I would assume, or what was your mindset going into your rookie season? Well, the biggest mindset was, you know, Tommy Martin won a classic in 1974. And uh, I was guiding down there with him, and he kept telling me, he said, man, Larry, he said, you catch way too many fish. You could be a great fisherman, and that's what you ought to do instead of all this guiding. He said, all you're going to do is guiding and go broke buying stuff to fish with every year and tearing up stuff. And he said, you need to fish bass. And I said, really, you think I can make it? And he said, you're the only man I know that catches fish every day. It don't matter whether it's cold, hot, still, windy, or what. He said, I think you can do good at that sport. And uh, so I stuck my neck out and and, uh, tried. And, of course, the first tournament I went to, I think I was 16th or something in Florida. Then I had to skip Toledo Bend because it was my home lake and I couldn't afford the off-limits period. And uh, so (laughs) Went to Virginia and then I done good in Virginia and wound up making the classic that first year and finishing second to the master of Rick Klein himself. And uh, uh, I said, you know what? I, I got and I got ten thousand dollars. If you remember, second place. That was the very first classic that paid second place. It's usually winner take all. Wow. And, Ten thousand dollars saved my butt because I was one broke little puppy at that time, and uh, you know I got all that money back that I lost from guiding, and then Rick helped me get a sponsor, and uh, somebody else helped me get another sponsor, you know, to help pay expenses. But uh, 
it's been a great ride, Ray. That's uh, Dave. That's all I can say about that. It was, uh, you know, a dream come true. It wasn't. It wasn't something that I really thought would happen when I first started fishing bass. Yeah. I, I thought it was a way to make money and go back and go to college and finish my college <laughs> and then to a career. Do you ever go back to college? No. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's kind of how I got into it. I was going to college and then I told dad, I said, I'm broke, man. I'm bar. I borrowed all this money. And I said, they are slaughtering them at Toledo Bend and they're begging for guides. If you'll let me borrow your boat for three months, I promise I'll have it back home the first of April. And I, after three months of guiding every single day in three months, I've sent him enough money and he went and bought him another boat and I just kept that one. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it just, uh, just a snowball that started rolling and never quit. You, I mean, one of the greatest careers in the history of the sport you've had, but to be blunt, it's been, um, as of today, I believe, and the math will be even more when we get there. When you launch your boat, it's going to be roughly 6,002. As of today, it's 6,108 days since you fished a Bassmaster event. <laughs> oh. what, what goes through your mind when you hear that? <laughs> wow. You know, I, I did go to Rayburn in October. so I. Well, have that's my- true. You're right. But... Uh... You know, to fish, to fish the elites is, uh, it, it, I've been wanting to come back for a long time, but you know, it, it, things in this world, you, you never know what's going to happen from one year to the next. And it seemed like I was always just a step away. Uh, you know, somebody would be affiliated with the wrong organization and I, I just couldn't get it together to make the jump back into bass. And, uh, fortunately this year it all came back together and, uh, I worked hard to get back my elites. Believe me, I had to write emails and ask questions, and and I got the invite, and I was like, ah, I got invited, so <laughs> I kept it, and here we go. It uh, it's been something that I've been hearing about for years. You know what I mean? It, 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 so I can confirm that you have been working on it for a while because I'd always hear, uh, yeah, like this rumblings that Larry Nixon's going to come back, and and obviously. Be an efficient geek growing up. I, I'm excited to have you back on the Elite Series. But will you, how do you think that first morning's going to feel? Take off the. I mean, I know I know you fished an open, but to be be on the Elites and and would do you does Larry Nixon still get nervous the morning of a tournament? Like, what do you think will go through your mind that morning? Why well, if they stick one of them cameras in my boat? Just <laughs> back or first day back? Yeah. I won't be able to even tie my hook on. So uh, <laughs> maybe they'll cut me a little slack and let me rest a day or two before that happens. But uh, you never know. I, yeah, I'm going to be a bundle of nerves. I really am. And my hands shake already as it is, believe me. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be a little bit nervous. I sure will. Do you think that makes you a better worm fisherman? No. The shaking hands? <laughs> I just... If I can't hold that rod still, that real good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh you know going to florida is a big plus maybe it won't be so cold down there because cold is brutal on me anymore my hands just don't work good when they get cold and uh, uh i'm hoping going to florida to get the bugs out and uh going back to a lake that i fished a lot of times maybe i can figure out how to catch some bigger fish and uh and you know make a show and i want points every tournament i'm here for points what well, what would be more shocking to you and your in if, if I could ask you a question back in 77 at the end of your rookie season, you've got that ten thousand dollar check feeling good. And if I said to you, when you're 72 years old, you're gonna be fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series, and that's <laughs> one thing. That's pretty shocking. But which is more shocking? That or the fact that you're 72 years old, you're fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series, and you're not even the oldest angler on tour. I thought that one. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be the oldest, but I'm going to be right there with him. But I'll guarantee you one thing: I've had I've had more surgeries and cut things cut on and fixed, and uh, Rick ain't never been into all that stuff. So uh, he's been blessed with a, uh, a 
uh, a history of no arthritis. So he hadn't got many wore out parts yet, but uh, just being there, it, it'd be like starting over, Dave. I'm telling you, it's, it's uh, after being away this long, uh, yeah, this will be like my first bass event. Have, have you talked to Clun since this became official? No, he's texted me a time or so and put, made say, said some things on Facebook, you know, about uh, glad to have you back and uh, this and that. And you'd be amazed how many of the elites have sent me uh, texts and, and deals on Facebook and glad that I'm back. And, uh, you know, that's a good feeling. So at least I know that I'm welcome. I'm sure there's somebody that don't want me back. I'll never forget when we, when, uh, when I had to switch circuits, you might say back in 2002 or something. Uh -huh. I remember one of the pros saying, uh, you know what, that's going to be kind of good because now we're going to have a couple more checks open up. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. That's, that ain't nice. <laughs> Everybody's trying to make a paycheck. Yeah, the, the, the odds were good every tournament that I would at least score a check. And because uh, that's kind of the way I fish tournaments. Uh, you know, I felt like to survive, you had to you had to break even every tournament. And then when the opportunity presented itself, maybe you'd be lucky enough to win. And uh, you, you need to be a winner if you're going to get big sponsors. That's for sure. What's your goal in returning? Is this is this a victory lap or are you here to, to to pad that trophy shelf behind you a little more? I you know I'd love to win another bass event. My gosh, I, it's been about seven or eight years, nine since I've won a big tournament. But uh, like I say, my my goal right now is to make the classic. If I can accumulate enough points over the year in nine tournaments to make the Bass Masters Classic. I'm a champion. You know, that's the way I look at it. And uh, I'll worry about winning later, but I just want to be consistent and not embarrass myself fishing and uh, make the Bass Masters Classic because it's the biggest play. It's the biggest tournament in the world. And uh, then I'll get to go back and see all them, them old lifetime members like me and uh, have a big time at the Classic. It would honestly be incredible to have you back there. I mean, the only thing more incredible would be like you and Clon on the final day, one and two. Go, I mean, we would blow up the internet if that happened. Oh, it would be, uh, yeah. We'd break lots of cameras, I promise you. <laughs> uh, back in the day, it was me and him and Denny. You know, every time you looked up, buddy, the three of us were fighting it out, and uh, uh, we were that strong. And then Cochran come in there, and, 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 you know, we were just consistently good and spent a lot of time on the water and preparing for tournaments. And, uh, yeah, if me and Rick both could go to that classic and it would be pretty huge. I'd love to see it happen. Um, I know a lot of anglers have been intimidated by you over the years. You know, I mean, I, I believe there'll be some intimidated with you when you were, I mean, you're Larry Nix. I know I get it. You're a guy who would rather just be hunting right now, but, but you are Larry Nixon. But has anyone ever intimidated you when you first came on tour? Was there anybody intimidating over the years? Uh, I was pretty scared of Greg Hackney and Jason Christie. Uh, <laughs> both of them boys are, you know, they're, they're tough as boots. And uh, Rick, you know, you, you always had, that was a man I had to beat in them days. And Denny, and uh, I'm not going to say I was intimidated, but I knew who was stalking me. Uh, and, and it was just, I don't know that I've ever been scared of anybody, but I'm scared of these elites now. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you real quick. Uh, they are, they, they've got the tools, you know, to do things and the, and the casting accuracy. I'm liable to throw up in the bushes, right? I'm going to be honest with you plain this day. My accuracy is not very good anymore, but I do a bass like the back of my hand. And, uh, you know, I, I can survive. I'm going to put it that way. But watching these kids fish, oh, no. When they skip that frog under that overhang, I about throw up. You know, I never, <laughs> never, ever in my career did I have to take a frog, skip it 20 feet back in under a dock or a buzz bait 
I never had a doc to do that at it to lead a man. It's not something I've ever practiced. So I still can't. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that you have the, have the fish changed at all over all these years? I mean, is that why they're having to be more precise? Uh, they're, they're actually probably fishing for fish that, uh, that they don't have to worry about me catching to be honest. <laughs> I mean, that's, so I, I look for fish that suit my style and, uh, you know, if I can find enough of them, then I'll do well. If, if I have to fish for them, I, I've never fished more than I'm in trouble. I, I hear you say that, but uh, I've followed your career enough to know you're pretty <clears throat> adaptable. I mean, you have, I mean, you've consistently qualified for championships ever since leaving Bass. It's not like you went away and haven't, you've won all, at FLW, you've, you've, but the big question everybody's asking is the thing that some people love and some people hate forward facing sonar is, is that going to be on your boat and what are your thoughts on it? Well, I'll be honest with you on that one too. Yes. It's on my boat. Do I like it? No, but it's part of the evolution. I've seen it all uh, in, in 44 or 45 years. I've seen everything you can imagine. And uh, when it came out, I was like, oh, wow, boy, I can go catch a whole bunch of crappie now. Never did I realize it's going to be such a tool for bass. And uh, I, I've preached for 25 or 30 years doing seminars, you know, that one of the key things about catching a bass is to present your lure straight to his head where he can't see it coming. And when it falls by him, he's going to react on it. Well, now them kids can see that fish and do that precise cast and make that fish react. So, uh, you know, it's something I knew I had to learn. And there was actually a tournament this past year that every single fish I caught, I saw him on forward facing solar. And uh, I'm a Lawrence guy. I use the active target, but it's 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 not here like it. I guess it, I'm I'm not saying it should be, but it ain't me. I'm I've always found my fish fishing. So to go out there and troll around all day and look at that unit and try to spot fish to cast at, oh, that's going to be a hard habit for me to get into and. Uh, I, 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 by looking at the elite schedule, one of the things that I really liked about it, there's six events that I ain't got to worry about that thing. You know, there's six events, the first ones. Now that second three or the last three, oh yeah, I'm going to go back to being a kid and pull that active target out and learn how to see fish on it and, you know, figure out how to catch them. Is it comparable to anything that you've seen come along? I mean, sometimes people will say, oh, well, it's just like when the first graphs came out or when side imaging came out. Is it comparable? You watched them both come and you've seen how they affected tournaments. Yeah, it's not really comparable because you're seeing stuff between the top and the bottom that we look for on the bottom with depth finders and flashers and, and down facing sonar and uh, you know, I used to conceive bass 30 feet deep on a flasher, just a red blip. If I seen three or four red blips, you can bet I was fixing to get a bite. And that's, I was good at that, real good at that. And uh, But forward-facing sonar is another animal because you're fishing for fish that 15 years ago were not catchable. Yeah, They were, were catchable because you couldn't make that cast to present it to them, you know, straight over the their heads. And... Uh, get them to react so uh it's a it's a whole different animal and there is you know buck perry had a book and one of the things i, I don't remember the exact words but he said 90 percent of the fish are always behind your boat and you know when you use forward facing sonar you see just how accurate he was because a lot of them fish out there living around in that 30 40 50 foot water and they're only down 20 feet they're bass you know, we used to think most of them were white bass, but no, they're bass. And uh, that's where it became so popular and so so good in certain tournaments. A lot of times you hear, um, and I don't know if it's just a current thing, but you hear today's anglers are more aggressive or more, there's more battles that happen on the water. But I, I know that it wasn't 
always a church uh, to steal a line from Trip Weldon. It's not a church service out there every day. <laughs> um, I'm sure it wasn't back in your, you know, when you first started. But do, do you agree? Do you think today's anglers are a little more aggressive? They're a little bit more aggressive, but here's the way I look at that. They are way more educated and they all tend to find a lot of the same fish. So you're going to, you're going to wind up with, uh, with, with a little bit bigger crowded areas. And, uh, uh, we didn't have to use the deal with that because it was always kind of a code of conduct. If somebody was there, you didn't pull in and get on, you know, you waited till they leave. If you knew them fish was there and then you pull in and fish behind them. Now you might, can I fish with you? You know, that, that happens. And uh, I've had it happen and I've, I've got where it don't bother me no more. I'm just gonna, you know, I'll either fish there or I'll go look for something else. But uh, yeah, there's nothing sacred anymore. These, these kids are good and they all find the good areas and uh, they don't mind running a hundred miles to do it. Now that's kind of one thing that I'm a little bit out of nowadays. I don't like boat rides no more, Dave. <laughs> Big long boat rides, I don't care for. So I tend to, I tend to try to do my fishing within 20, 25 miles of takeoff. Yeah. When you guys were doing draw tournaments, there must have been some wars then, though. Like I, I mean, I, I just feel like if we put, if we did draw tournaments that said you guys are are fishing in the same boat and you got to figure this out, we'd literally have fist fights at our events now i would assume back in the day though it must there must have been some well there was arguments yeah <laughs> flips uh i don't know i was i was fortunate in that way most people i didn't ever get a reputation of being a a hog in the front of the boat and uh I, I very rarely ever had to flip a coin and me and my partners usually both caught fish. That was one thing. I, that was my guy. I, I'd tell them real quick, you know, my goal is for both of us to have a good day. And uh, if you want to run the trolling motor half the day, you can, or if you want me to run it, I'll leave you plenty of water, all air, whatever. But I always got it worked out. And uh, I never really had any battles except maybe one with Hank Parker. <laughs> you don't have big Hank stand on the front deck of a, a little skinny bass boat with Hank Parker. He's got them hips and he loves to just go doink, doink. <laughs> and he'll dance when I drew him all day long. He says, how deep is it, Larry? I'd say, it's eight foot, Bill. And I'd be fishing. He'd say, how deep is it, Larry? And I'd look down. I said, Bill, it's 10 foot. How deep is it, Larry? This went on for about four hours when I finally Bill, you're standing right there. It's right there. Just all you got to do is look down. He said, this is strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, said, I'm trying, trying to distract you. <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot of strategy back in the day. Yeah, it was. Uh, we, you just had to work it out. Every tournament, you had to work it out with your partner. And, uh, and to me, it wasn't no big deal. We, we had a few arguments on the water when somebody would pull in and you knew good and well, they wouldn't, they didn't really know them fish was there, but they could see you over catching them. Now that, that was a different deal there. I might holler at somebody for that. And, uh, but <laughs> it was all fun and games. Who's the greatest angler you've ever shared the boat with? Oh my goodness. I've never really had the, I, I've never really thought about that. I, I, I've been in the boat with all of them. Uh, I've been in the boat with Kevin. I've fished with Denny. I've fished with uh, Rick. I've drew them all pretty much sometime or another. Uh, you own the Kevin Van Dam story? Yeah, sure. We were at, uh, I think it was, well, I'm not sure where we were, but anyway, he, he's on a bunch of fish, but he said, my fish won't bite till after nine. And I said, well, Rick, I've got a couple of places over here, or Kevin, I've got a couple spots over here where we can go catch three or four pretty good ones early in the morning on Carolina rig. And he said, that sounds good. We'll just go fishing. And, and uh, so anyway, we take off and we get over where we're going and you know how fast Kevin is. He's like a lightning bolt up out of that seat. 
and I'm still dropping the troll motor over and going toward this point and he's back in the back and the running light's still in and he don't even think about that running light and he reached back with a Carolina rig and that lizard went shoop, about four around that light and he went and the, his reel was this big around. I mean, <laughs> I clash. And I turn around, I'm laughing at him. And I said, Kevin, reach in that rod box and get another rod. Take that dad gum running light out and get it out of your way. <laughs> and we went on, then we went on up the river to his fish and we cranked. We had a big time. We both caught fish. And uh, Kevin was great. Denny was great. Tommy Martin is awesome. Uh, George is simple, but probably the best shallow water fisherman I've ever known in my whole life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to say, I, it'd be hard to say who was the greatest. Have you, is there anyone you haven't fished with that you're like, that's somebody who I'd, I'd love to share a boat with? Well, there's a couple of them, but right now I'm lost and I can't to tell you who it is. Uh, I always wanted to, I always wanted to go fishing with David Fritz when he was on the deep spot and spend a day in the boat with him because cranking has never been a big part of my game. Deep, deep cranking, I'm great down to about 10 foot, but then big plugs and and getting it down there 20 foot deep. No, I'm pretty poor at that. And uh I wanted to spend time with him in a tournament and do that with him someday. I'm probably would have had to throw a jig to get a bite, but uh, you know, it'd been cool to watch him. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest, and I've asked him this before. Um, and you you mentioned the light post. I swear to you, when I was a little kid sitting on the carpet, I would literally scream at my TV because I would watch him. And David Fritz is a much better angler than I could ever dream of being. Uh, but he would walk those fish around the boat, and it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and he's going hand over hand around his light post. I'm like, remove the light post. You don't need the light post anymore. Um, so yeah, Fritz has frustrated me with that. And I asked him, he said, well, I just di didn't think about it till now, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do people I, think? Sorry, go ahead. Lot, there's, there's a lot of little things that goes on and a lot of little things in preparation and doing all that, that some fishermen, it just, they just don't think about it. And, uh, I see it all the time watching Bassmasters. I'm watching them guys and they stop and retie or put, uh, a blade on a spinner bait, and I'm thinking, why in the heck didn't you have three spinner baits rigged up? You know, cut that sucker off, throw it in the floor, tie another one on if you got an issue, and uh, or you know, they break a drop shot off, and they sit down and rig up a whole drop shot. Well, I'm like just Lucas. <clears throat> I'm going to have about ten of them suckers rigged up because I promise you, I'm going to blow about half of them up. <laughs> what? What was Kevin? like when he first came on tour because because i feel like and i've asked him trust me there's no amount of alcohol i can feed that man for him to open up about his first few years on tour but i'm like <laughs> he's a confident person today i'm sure he was with what much more testosterone running through his system at young 20s i'm sure he was a little more confident and he's from the north he at a time when nobody from the north was really making a mark in the sport what what did what did people think of Kevin Van Dam when he first showed up? Well, I thought he was a cocky little sucker myself. <laughs> and why I thought that was me and Tommy was doing a seminar at Kalamazoo, Michigan, up there at his daddy's boat dealership or his brother's. Yeah. And this little 15-year-old kid walked over there and after we got done doing our seminars and we're talking and he stuck that hand out and he said, hey, I'm Kevin Van Dam and I'm going to kick your ass. And I said, really? And I shook his hand. I said, well, just come on and get you some whenever you're old enough. By golly, he did. <laughs> he made it happen. He was, he was awesome, incredible. And, uh, you know, he was very similar to me in ways because he's, he's been in the outdoors his whole life. So there's, there's nothing that he's, that gets him out of whack. He, he, he fished a little too fast in the very beginning, but if you notice later on, he's, he figured out that high fish fast, but slow down. And, uh, he, he's an amazing angler and what he did in the sport and is doing is, uh, 
I don't know that we'll ever see that again because now we got too many good ones. And for somebody to just jump out there and stand out like he did at that time, uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever see that again. He, the long, he, put it this way, the longevity of winning, what do you win, four classics? Four classics, seven angler of the years, and he's qualified for 25 classics. Or, or it, he's won, tw sorry, 20, 28 or 29 classics, but he's won 25 events. That's where I was going with that, which is uh, unbelievable. Uh, it's it, it, For one man to do that, and I'm not going to say it's not going to happen because, I mean, stuff happens. You know that. And uh, there can be one of these little high school kids come along and he's just got nothing but a one-way brain of winning tournaments. And it can, it can happen, but whew, with so many good competitive fishermen like there is now, it's, he, he's really going to have to be a, a distinct individual. That statement you made about Kevin when he first met you, I mean, th that's a – legendary story but it's you hear stories like that about tom brady i mean tom brady walked up to robert Kraft, a six-round draft pick and yep. introduced himself as i'm tom brady the best decision or best draft pick you've ever made or something like that or best decision this team's ever made and i'm sure robert Kraft at the time thought oh, well wow no six rounders pretty cocky but is that cockiness do you think there's part of that needed you know when when you're i mean you're in your young twenties, you're trying to overcome years of knowledge. Is it needed to have that kind of, you know, that self-confidence? Yes. Without a doubt, that self-confidence that he had, I mean, it was bubbling out of him. And, uh, you know, me and Tommy were standing there together when he said that he didn't just say it to me, he just said it to both of us. And, uh, Tommy said, boy, He's a confident little sucker, ain't he? And I said, yeah, he is. But, of course, Kevin wasn't little. Right? Heck, he was a little taller than I was even at that time. And uh, uh, he, he, I'm, I'm going to say he was, he was good at that time, and he, would, he knew he was going to be good. And that's just the way he was. You know, when I was, when I was, 20 years old or 27 years old when I first started fishing bass, I thought I could catch one in a, in a commode. And uh, that's how confident I was. I was going to catch fish. It didn't matter where you took me. And, uh, but, you know, that to come from, from a kid, I had never heard that in my whole life. And that, uh, it, I, I said, well, that's, that's from him being from Michigan. He's, he's got a different level of confidence than, say, an archy that's kind of laid back and uh, I'm not going to say we're in a little shell or we're in a little hole, but we don't really let our confidence out in words. And, uh, but he was that good. He really was. Yeah. He definitely backed it up. And, and I'll be honest, um, even when our families get together and we go and do, I mean, he, he said that to me about cornhole games. You want to play cornhole? Oh yeah, sure. Kevin, I'm going to kick your ass. So, I mean, he, he hasn't changed. Um, is that a trait in all the great tournament anglers in the way that like when you guys get together and, and that's the coolest thing about my job that I get to have a front row seat to some of the coolest conversations about people that I used to read about in magazines. And now I consider friends but man, you guys are all competitive. Like it doesn't matter whether it's uh, fishing, hunting. I mean, like it, phones come out and people start scrolling. Look at this thing that showed up on my camera. Is that a trait that co competitive, that always wanting to beat the other angler? Is that a trait you need to have to be a great angler? Yes, it is. It's, it's the, it's the desire to win and knowing that you can win and, because I'm going to tell you right now, if you ain't got confidence in yourself and your abilities, then you're already in deep trouble. And uh, so that carries over into everything we do, whether it's hunting, golf, uh, just having a good time. Uh, it, it, it's, I don't know, it's just part of our DNA. And, you know, fishermen, we, we're all friends. There ain't no such thing as I don't like that guy. I, I don't, that just don't happen very, very often in this sport. No, it's an incredible group of people. Um, and one thing that you were incredible about 
throughout. I mean, it seems weird in this. I'll be honest. There's times I'm like in your career, like I'm looking back on it, but I'm also excited to have you in the elite series. So your career is still going. But one thing that obviously you hear a lot about is your success in mega bucks format. I mean, number one, I wish it would come back and I'm hoping Larry Nixon brings it back. I mean, the king of Mr. Mega Bucks is here. Why were you so dominant in those events? Well, I, the, I, the only thing I can think about it is I spent so much time guiding on Toledo Bend. I knew exactly when I was done catching fish. I knew exactly why I caught a fish. And when you go to Mega Bucks, you've got 50 minutes in each hole. And a lot of times I'd just run down the bank and I'd say, okay, these fish live right over there. And I'd fish for one fish. I mean, that was just my, my theory in mega bucks was to catch one bass in every hole. If I caught one bass, then I'd probably win. And, uh, so that's the way I fished each event. I didn't try to fish that hole back gun hole. No, I didn't do that at all. I picked out a 50 yard stretch and I've methodically picked it apart and, Eventually, I'd either catch one or I would find a key hole in there, or a key spot in that hole and, uh, you know, work them over. And uh, the other thing was mega bucks was lots of money. At that time, at that time the classic paid 25000 Now, I think it eventually went to fifty there, but still mega bucks was $100,000. And uh, I set my sights on that tournament more or less every single year. And it, it worked for about four of them. And then uh, like a second and another one and maybe third and one. I, I can't remember all the statistics, but uh, uh, it was just a tournament that, that I was good at. I was fast. And uh, you know, that's what it was. I just try to find the most productive spot in each quarter mile of water, and I'd fish that right. I wouldn't mess it up by getting too close. You know, I'd fish it, switch baits or something, and fish it again. And uh, eventually, I'd get something going. And uh, I don't know, it's just right down my alley. I feel like I'm, I know the answer to this, but is that something you'd like to see come back? Oh, my, yeah, that was that was an awesome turn. It was, it was. It was one of the most televised events there ever was at that time. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's all right to have a tournament, but then take them last 10 guys and like say, Hey guys, let's go over here and shoot a really, really good show. Let's have a, let's have a winter deal where you got the 10 whole course. And, uh, it's not that hard to do. It's, uh, uh, you know, we did it on Lake Murray. We did it in lots of different places, Chickamauga and, uh, uh, of course, Florida. We did, what, three down there, four. And, uh, but no, I'd love to see it come back because that was, that was awesome. Yeah. And I personally think it'd be even cooler today in the way that like with technology and everything, being able to see everything. And it, I mean, there's so many elements that they could add to it that uh, I think it, it, uh, and I think it's also, I mean, if we've learned anything the last number of years, we we all bought in when we were kids watching or whatever. This is like the uh, the current Elite Series pros grew up watching pros in the Elite Series, and and you know what I mean. And different events, and and to bring it back, I mean, it just it makes a lot of sense sense to me. This is a weird question for you. You fished with some incredible anglers growing up and, and, and seen in this sport, sadly, you've seen so many incredible anglers come and go that just, they might be great anglers, but for whatever reason, they just didn't hang on. It, it didn't work out for them. Why you, why, when you look at your career, I mean, you, you must, must be amazed with what's happened, but it's still your life. But why do you think what sets you aside from the others? Well, I don't know whether it was love of the outdoors, belief in God, you name it. It was, uh, it, it was something. I, I'm going to tell you what, I've been in tune with the outdoors my whole life. And uh, it, it's like when I'm not seeing anything, I know why. When I'm not catching anything, I know why. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, I've just been out there my whole life. And uh, it, it's a feel, it's a, a sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. Uh, 
and and the desire to succeed and not only that i don't fish much outside my strengths you know i saw that that i've always said you better by golly stay within your boundaries or you're not going to succeed in this sport and by that i mean don't go out there fishing a swim bait uh, just because somebody says they're biting it if you don't know much about it and you don't have any confidence in it then that's a waste of your time you better find your fish no matter where you go and the great fishermen and you know, that's why I say these kids now are so good. I see them doing things and it succeeds one tournament, but it's usually not a every tournament deal. They've got to, they've got to adapt to the things that, that we all did by every tournament's a new, new fishing hole, you know, forget what happened last time. I can go out there with six rods rigged up and practice. That's me. You know, I look at them and they got 20 on each side and I was like, uh, I fall in, uh, let's see, I break four or five. Uh, I don't do that. I may have 20 in this rod box, but there's only going to be four or five out here in my way until I figure out what's going on with fish. And uh, so I stay with inside my boundaries in all the years you always watched. Denny Brower would go find his kind of fish, flipping, pitching, cranking, spinner baiting. Rick Clun, he was a power, he's a power fisherman, but he would go hunt his kind of fish. I rarely ever saw him in practice because I, I didn't really, I wasn't really a mud holder. I wasn't really a shallow water runner. I didn't go up the river as far as I could possibly go and go back in a slough. Uh, I'd do it on special occasions when I knew that the lake itself was dead. Uh, and, you know, so I, I always looked for my own fish. I loved offshore fishing. Uh, I would see Fritz and Mark Davis more than I'd see anybody else, you know, because they'd be out there with a paper map like me trying to find the whole wad of them. You know, that was, to me, that was the ultimate, just find that big school that nobody else had found. And Klein was very good at that. If you remember, he won that tournament on the river, a school of fish and uh, right by takeoff, not far, and just sat there and blowed us away. And, uh, but that was his game, cranking, spinner baiting, buzz baiting. He wasn't a big flipper, but what did he do at uh, Lake Okeechobee? Picked up a red shad worm, left all of his other lures in the house because he could not catch a fish in Florida. And he went down there and won, the, won one of our tournaments on Okeechobee with a red shad culprit worm. So, <laughs> you know, when you realize that you're not good, in some place, then you do whatever works all the time. And that's, uh, that's what made Rick special because he wasn't scared to abandon his ship, so to say, and, and grab a worm and fish the way fish were caught in Florida. And, uh, but he, 90% of the time, he stays within his boundaries. And uh, George, if he couldn't touch bottom, you know, he would lost. Oh, forget this. You know, he might come follow me around if there wasn't no shallow fish nowhere, but... Uh, uh, it, good fishermen just believe in what they do and they stay with it till they find their kind of fish. When you look at Clun of today, I mean, people have made him into this mystical character, Mr. Miyagi sensei type, whatever you want to compare him to. How different was he 70s, 80s when you were new to the sport? Rick was always a loner. I'm, really i'm not saying he wasn't friendly it was just you know he was into what he believed in and and he didn't want to clutter up his process by hearing a lot of other stuff and uh and you know he was a master of that and uh i don't know he just uh he he was he was rick he was definitely rick he didn't talk a lot he wasn't he wasn't shy by no means. He'd get together and enjoy a beer with you and, uh, you know, them kind of things. But uh, his fishing was always mechanical. I mean, he was a, he was a mechanical guy. And uh, uh, he was just, uh, he didn't, I didn't fish like Rick. I even though I drew him and, and I had a ball with him throwing a, we was throwing a crack bait that day. We cracked all day long. It was 40 dead gun degrees, froze our tails off. Uh, I think the water temperature might have been 40 degrees too, because we only caught three fish between the two. 
and it was a it was bad but he was he was very much all business and that was rick he still is and, and it, the amazing still. thing about rick is how much he notices like that's what makes me see how because i just watch how much he notices stuff with people like you know what I mean? Like, uh, are you feeling okay? You've coughed six times since you were standing over there. And you're like, I didn't even remember. You, you know what I mean? So you can tell that he takes in all the little hints and tips and things like that, you know, on the water. I, I'm assuming that's part of, of what makes him him. Um, so what, what what a lot of on the Elite Series, there's a lot of teams, it seems. is that Was that ever a thing? Like, there's a lot of anglers that you know, openly talk about, I, I work with so-and-so. Did people work together as much in the past? Yes, we did. We, we, it wasn't, we didn't just like really work, but after a day's practice, you know, we'd get together and, and, uh, you know, do you do any good? And yeah, man, are, they, are the fish biting or, you know, when we passed along information, me and Tommy and George and, uh, uh, if Denny asked me something, I didn't mind telling him, or Rick asked me, I didn't mind telling him either. But as far as groups of us getting together and sit down looking at maps and working together, no, that did not happen. Uh, it was mainly just general information, and uh, you, you really couldn't talk about locations because then you'd wind up bumping into each other, you know, if it was all on the same pattern. And uh, so we, we never got into that that far. It was just, it was just maybe what are they biting on or, or uh, you know, are they deep or are they shallow? And that was about it. Are you going to work with anyone on the Elite Series? I'm going to work with Joey a little bit, sure. I'm going to have to have some help. I need somebody to launch my boat. I'm 72 years old. I want somebody to go help me put in in the morning. <laughs> I'm excited to have Joey on the Elite Series. I'm, I'm even more excited to finally start pronouncing his name right how, how do you say his name properly larry help me out here did you get that no i lost you there what what joey sequentes sequentes that probably ain't right sequentes <laughs> yeah but larry nixon told me that's how it said so i'll get away with it <laughs> yeah he'll let it go because he just looks at me when i say it wrong um how'd you guys pair up I mean, you, you at the, I mean, how old's Joey? I mean, he's, he's not, he's pretty young man, right? Yeah, but he's, he's a good friend of, uh, I, I've got a veterinary friend that, uh, we get together and have a good time on Wednesday nights. And, uh, uh, this, this, he's a, he's a veterinarian and his boy was a pitcher in college. Well, Joey was a pitcher in college. And so they got to be big friends and Joey would come down there and we call it the palace and we'd get together and Joey had come down there occasionally. And I got to meet Joey and I knew he was fishing tournaments. And, uh, uh one time I said to him, I said, you, you know, uh, and this was back before they wouldn't let us do this kind of stuff. But I said, you know, if you want to fish, uh, next year, you probably, it'd be a good idea if you want to go with me and practice for the tournaments and uh, get in on the co-angler side. And I don't think he believed me at all. <laughs> like he was, he was, it was like no answer. <laughs> About three or four months later, I said, Joey, are you going to, you going to fish the tournament? And, well, I'm thinking about it. I said, we ought to get in and go practice with me. And he said, really? You know, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyway, we ran together for, I guess, three years. And uh, he actually won the co-angler side twice. He won two tournaments and all that fishing out of the back of the boat. And, and uh, he said, you know, I think I'll, I'll try it. And I said, well, yeah, you ought to. I know how good you are. And all you got to do is slow down now. Don't get back on that trolling motor going 24 miles an hour. Try to fish a boat dock. You got you to gotta develop a pattern before you do that. And, uh, and and he took it to heart, and he slowed down and became a really good fisherman. And now he'll be in the elites also. So that that's a big deal for me because I told him, I said, "Here's the number one rule right now: you make all of our room reservations." Because I'm sick of that. <laughs> I hate trying to find a place to stay. You, you you're in charge of the rooms and and uh, where we stay and all that. So I've, I've already put him to work. Well, good, good. And, and so, and I mean, 
And so he should. You're Larry Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> when you look back in your career, any, I don't even like the word regrets, but anything you, you would have done differently? Or is it all experiences? It's all new experiences. You know, I've, I've had some sponsor changes over the years that I absolutely hated, but there wasn't nothing I could do about it. That's, yeah. part, of, that's part of the business game. Uh, as far as things that I would have changed, no, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't change nothing because, uh, you know, there's been a many, a many a tournaments that I thought were mine. I was going to win this tournament, and then I finished 50th. I mean, uh, that's just the way fishing is. When you really think you're on them, you get your brains beat in, and then the next one you go to, you have the worst practice you ever had in your whole life, and you win, or you you know get a top five or something. But uh, that's fishing, and it's uh, every day is a new day in a fish's life, and uh, he he wakes up just like we do. Some days he feels good, some days he don't feel good, and it's up to me to figure that part out in my my day's work. What's the greatest advice you've been given in your, not, it doesn't have to be fishing, but the greatest advice you've ever been given in your life? Wow. I guess probably a book that I read, uh, The Power of Positive Thinking. You ever read that? I have. Norman Peale, right? Yep. Look at me sounding studious. This is, you know, that's uh, the, the brain is the most important part. Now, I'm sounding like Clum all of a sudden, uh, but confidence and believing that it's going to happen is so important. And, uh, I, you know, nobody gave me that advice. My mother handed me that book. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it stuck. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's so true because if you don't think that it's going to happen and you don't have confidence in your abilities, then it's probably not going to happen. So you have to have, I mean, even if you're having a horrible day, you know, you just got to keep thinking it's going to happen. And uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it don't. But if you don't, if you don't have that positive attitude, then you're not going to catch fish and you're not going to succeed at anything that I know of. It's kind of crazy because you know where I got that book? My mom gave me that same book. <laughs> so I, I don't know if it came out in the in the parenting handbook or what, but uh, it's wild to hear that's where you got it from. Yeah, it worked. It really did. I mean, it's like, you know, there's there's a whole lot of things in there you question kind of because that's just human nature. But it's that it is it finally just drilled it into my head that you got to think positive or you're not going to have that positive feeling and you're not going to, you're not going to have positive things happen to you. So, uh, it's, it's important. What's the worst advice you've ever been given in your life? <laughs> uh, that's a good one because I probably didn't pay any attention to that one. Uh, I'm real good at, at throwing out bad stuff and keeping good stuff. So, uh, uh, I don't know that I've ever had anything like worst advice ever was, except get a job. Yeah. Somebody told me I wasn't ever going to make a living at fishing. You need to, I know who it was. It was a friend of mine in Kentucky, Mr. Bill Schrader. He says, Larry, you really, <clears throat> you really need to get a job or go back to school and get a job because this fishing might not pan out. That's what I was guiding. Boy, I'm glad I didn't listen to him. <laughs> and so <laughs> he, am I. He was a smart man and a very good friend of mine. And, uh, but his first advice when I was guiding, he says, yeah, you really need to go back to school and, and get, get you a good uh, education and uh, a good job. And at that time, I really didn't like that advice and I, I didn't utilize it. <laughs> it's wild though, behind every pro angler, there's, it's so I always think there's everybody has that everybody, whether it's a school teacher, whether it's a parent, whether it's somebody, there was somebody who said, there's no way you're going to do this. And I think honestly, that's one of the things that drives a lot of people to accomplish things. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah. You kind of broke up there a little bit. Uh, at the end. Say that one more time. 
and behind every pro angler, everybody who makes it in different sports, there's somebody who told you you couldn't make it. Um, it's amazing. Like everybody has that. I think that that's a big motivator for a lot of people to make it is, is the hate. Yes, I agree with you totally. Uh, one thing I do know, and my father and mother uh, never, ever really tried to influence me on what I did in, early in my life. And, you know, up until I was 18. <clears throat> in fact, when I was about 18, Daddy said, all right. He says, I'm done. I've did all I can do so far. You know, we didn't have any money back then. And uh, he said... Uh, he said, I'll do what I can and I will help what I can, but you need to take care of yourself from here on. And that was, that was really good advice. So, you know, I constantly worked even when I wasn't uh, in school. I was guiding over on the lake when I was 16 years old on weekend. I didn't even have a boat, but the, uh, the marina manager knew I loved to fish and he would put me in a boat and give me half the guide fee. And uh, so, you know, it was, uh, it was, I, I've been doing this my whole life and the, uh, uh, but they taught me, you know, to work and don't be scared to work, but they never, ever told me that I couldn't fish for a living ever. And, uh, or I had to go to school, uh, you know, that, that wasn't part of it. High school. Yes. I had to go to school, but, uh, as far as college and, uh, and, uh, everything was my decision after I was 18, I might ask them, do you think this is a good idea? And dad say, yeah, probably that's, if you, that's what you want to do. And, uh, you know, it was always positive and, uh, uh, they never really influenced me not to do something. That's uh, that's great stuff. Um, and, and it's, it's a real lesson. Like, I think that one of the biggest problems in today's world is not enough parents say, Hey, now you got to start being an adult. You got to start doing, you know what I mean? It, it, it's part of life. Trust me. I've tried to avoid it my whole life. I'm still on a daily basis trying to avoid it, but it's the hard truth that like at some point life is up to you. That's exactly right. It's up to you to make your own decisions now. And I'm not going to, you're not going to freak load off us for the rest of your life. That's pretty much what he said. You're 18 now. It's time for you to get out there and take care of yourself, your own business, take care of your own money. If you're hungry, I'll feed you. Uh, you know, they, they, they did everything they possibly could, but I wasn't going to be no freeloader. I can tell you right now, daddy wasn't going to tolerate that. They, he was, uh, you know, it was, he, he wasn't kidding me one bit and I knew he wasn't because I'd worked with him at the shop and, uh, swept the floors and did different things, but all through high school and, uh, before I started guiding at the lake, but, uh. You know, he taught me to be a man and he wanted me to be my own man. And that's why he said when I was 18, he said, look, I've did all I can do. You graduated from school and uh, time for you to take care of yourself. And he was smart. Well, I think it worked. I think it worked, Larry. <laughs> I think you I think things worked out pretty good for you. Um, and, and a sure sign of that is things just keep getting better. I mean, you're on the elite series now and I have one simple request because there are certain things like growing up, I was a real weirdo kid. You know what I mean? Like I had Hank Parker's, I had a picture of Hank Parker when he won a second classic in my locker in high school, like buddies had pictures of whole different things. And, and, but I was just like, that was such, you know, the bass masters was always such a big thing. So certain things are like etched into my head and I'll be honest, when they told me you were coming to the Elite Series, I was super excited. Super excited the chance of you coming. But then when they told me you don't live in B Branch, Arkansas anymore, I was like, wait a second, I'm going to screw up this intro every single time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, my wife made me move, Dave. We, we had a nice house in B Branch, but it was big. It was way too us. And so we moved out here to the farm. I, I bought this farm several years ago. Amy has always said, Megabucks bought this farm. You know that? And I said, yeah, I know it did. Because it was it was in an annuity and you'd get paid so much money every year. And I said, I can buy that 600 acres. So I did. And she built this house out here. And I kept thinking she was crazy. And because I, I never dreamed she'd sell her other house, but she did. 
And all of a sudden I was stuck out here in the middle of the boondocks with all the deer and the turkey and uh, my nearest neighbor's almost two miles away. And I, I didn't even have no place to put my boat, nothing. <laughs> and, uh, so I had to leave my boat somewhere for about a year until I got this, this shop here built where I could just drive through. And, and uh, but I'm still out in the boondocks and I've just now got internet. So uh, this is one of the first podcasts I've ever done. You're kind of lucky there. But uh, now uh, I love it out here. You know, I don't, I don't, I barely ever hear a vehicle. If you come down my road, you are coming here or you are trespassing. So, <laughs> so where, where do you live? What's the name of the town? Is it close to B Branch? I am exactly halfway between B Branch and Whitman, Arkansas. So you say, I'm but. just inside this postal system so I had to change addresses <sighs> yeah so now I'm from Quitman but you all can right. see branch anytime you want and I will be mad all right all right well maybe we'll do a poll or something should we should we change because because the the home address is like some people move like they don't even live in the same state anymore, but they're synonymous. Like the best, in my opinion, the, and I tell him this all the time, Davey Height had the best two towns to ever be from. I mean, initially he was from prosperity, South Carolina, which is, I mean, how much fun was that to say for, for, for Ray Scott. And then he left prosperity. And you're like, well, it's all downhill from here. Now he's from 96 South Carolina, both great towns to say. So I might drop a B branch here and there, but, I'm excited to have you back in the Elite Series. I'm even more excited that you have Wi-Fi so we could do this. No, probably more excited about the Elite Series, I'd say. Um, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, Larry. Well, I'm going to do the best I can to make it a great year. And uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, Dave. I'm going to have fun. And, I, and when I quit having fun, I'll quit fishing. But I'm going to have fun. I'm going to enjoy the year. And I'm going to have fun with the guys. and. Uh, you know, the fishing to me, it's a gravy now. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm going to have fun, win, lose, or draw. What's your walkout song going to be? You know, I don't even know. I have no idea yet. I may oh. let my, this one. Mine's always kind of bland. You know, some old country western song. and I may let her pick out one that's hot. Okay. Okay. I look forward. Maybe what. Give us some suggestions in the comments. What song should Larry Nixon come out to on the Bassmaster Elite Series? Um, maybe we'll get a good suggestion, but but probably not. Probably not. Probably still better to go with, with your wife's suggestion. Um, thank you very much. I know what what do you got ahead of you uh in between now and seeing me in Florida? A lot of shooting uh, things. Yeah, a lot of hunting. Uh, this is my time of year to kind of you know clear the brain. I've always said that if you can clear your brain of, of uh, your job for two or three months, when you come back, it's like, wow, you know, I'm back fishing and it's awesome. You know, you're, you're eager to go out there and rig a tackle box and get everything in your boat just right for a specific tournament. And uh, so I, I pretty much let it go. My boat's sitting in here right now and it's got all my rods and reels and everything rigged in there from Champlain. And I haven't touched them since I parked it, not even to go fun fishing. Now, between now and Florida, I will go fun fishing a few times. But uh, when I get ready to come back to, to the tournament scene, uh, I'll be excited about it. Well, the entire tournament scene is excited to have you back. And uh, thank you very much for doing this. I, I, can't, I can't wait to uh, have Larry Nixon on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Thank you very much. And next time you see me, I will be presentable and I will look like a fisherman. And right now I just don't care. <laughs> you're 72 years old and you're freaking Larry Nixon. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, how cool was that? Um, if I seemed giddy, I was a little giddy. Um, and if you're not, you just don't understand who Larry Nixon is. I mean, Larry Nixon is literally one of the founding fathers of this sport. And to have him 
coming back to fish the elite series this year has me and many anglers really excited, many fans excited, but it's just unfathomable. I mean, I was just, while I was talking to him, I'm like, what he's doing right now to have him and Rick Klon both on the elite series competing. It's unbelievable. I mean, I think every once in a while we got to the fishing industry and every, and I, and I say the fishing industry, but I think every industry, every sport goes through different things, but I think we have, especially over the last number of years, there's been a lot of people that have, have podcasts have been a great spot for a lot of people to talk about negative in the sport. This is one of the most positive things ever. This is literally like fantasy sports in the way that, you know, you hear people talk all the time, whether it's baseball, they say, you know, how would Babe Ruth do today? How, how was he as good as the players of today? And we get to see it. It's not just a fantasy. We get to watch it all go down all year long on the Bassmaster Elite Series. And um, we're pretty lucky. That's all I'll say. We're all very, very lucky to watch this go down. Um, so happy to have Larry Nixon on the Elite Series. Um, everything he's accomplished in this sport and is continuing to accomplish is amazing. And um, wow, that's all I got to do is say wow. And um, give us lots of likes so that we seem cool to the YouTube algorithm. And hey, in the comments, let us know what song do you think Larry Nixon should come out to? Give us some ideas. Let us know. Maybe, maybe you can help Larry Nixon make his walkout song decision. And... Um, I'll see you guys next time. Freaking Larry Nixon. From one legend to another. Bob Cop, take it away. But as from one legend to another, I meant Larry Nixon to Bob Cop. I'm no part of that. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cop of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?